the Atlantic seaboard one fine morning in 1943, an imposing force of American naval air power proceeds to an important rendezvous. This force is the aircraft complement of a new carrier, fighters, dive bombers, torpedo bombers. With the air group commander leading everyone, they are flying out to sea to join the ship which will be their floating home and fighting base. He is one of many carriers which the American people have built since Pearl Harbor to destroy the enemy in his own part of the world far away. And there now is our base, powerful and serene. In honor of all American aircraft carriers, let us call her the Fighting Lady. Against a good solid wind with their tail hooks down, our planes come into the broad flight deck of their new home. In case the plane's hook fails to catch the arresting gear, there's a series of stout wire barriers. Number one man on the flight deck just now is the LSO, the landing signal officer, always a flyer himself. Like all aviators, he'd much rather be flying. Come on in and sit down. The plane is out of the groove and he waves it off. Come around another time, pilot, and we'll take you aboard. When planes land, they taxi quickly forward out of the way. Later, they'll have to be shifted to the stern and rearranged in proper position for takeoff. This is called respotting the deck. Here is our skipper, Jocko, a veteran Navy flyer, Annapolis 1917. He is not impressed by our earnest efforts, nor the flight deck control officers. The skipper calls all hands together and gives us a piece of his mind. We'll never be ready for combat unless you flight deck crews learn right now to work as a team. Don't you men realize that before long we'll be in dangerous waters? That's too slow, bear a hand. Watch out, keep that wing clear. Get it over to starboard, way over to starboard. Come on, get the lead out of your pants. Now this is the way your deck should look when you're ready for action. Our ship, our fighting lady, is enormous, wonderful, and strange to us. From stem to stern, the entire ship is a honeycomb of watertight and flame-proof compartments. Far below the water line are engine rooms, fire rooms, fuel tanks, and magazines packed with enough assorted high explosive to blow us all to kingdom come. The hangar deck is like a gigantic tunnel, nearly two city blocks long and wide enough to house four freight trains abreast. Take us a week, a month maybe, to learn our way around. These new surroundings are as mysterious to us as they are cold and impersonal. Our fighting lady is like a huge floating cave, noisy and uncomfortable. Elevators as big as a tennis court carry us topside to the flight deck. The great superstructure rising amidships is called the island. This is truly the ship's nerve center, its fighting brain. 85% of us who make up the fighting lady's family are volunteers in this war and have never been to sea before. We learned our jobs theoretically in intensive training ashore. A very short while ago, we were high school boys and college kids or bank clerks or farm hands or factory workers. Now we are blue jackets and marines all members of a naval combat team nearly 3,000 strong. In our multitude of new tasks and duties as a team, we're very green but 
curiosity and comradeship and the instinct of self-preservation are great teachers. Some of us have to master the delicate and complicated instruments which control the fire of our five-inch batteries, the guns that must defend the fighting lady when enemy dive bombers and torpedo planes attack. We train and train to learn our stuff and earn our E for efficiency. The fighting lady's destination is still a closely guarded secret. But no one can hide the fact that we are entering tropical waters. Our ship seems more friendly and comfortable now. We greenhorns feel that a suntan will at least make us look like fighting sailors. Even our mascot, Scrappy, has been at sea longer than most of us. Some of the mystery that has been hanging over us is lifted when we enter the Panama Canal. There is a lot of unprofessional nervousness about whether or not we're too big to get through the locks. By using lines instead of fenders, we do get through, as the naval constructors knew all along we would. Come on, hop aboard. We're going places. For two cents, I would. Do anybody want to swap? Now we stand out into the Pacific, and life aboard settles down into monotony. Here are our aircraft pilots, officers all. The ship's company call them the Glamour Boys. They are the men who fly and fight our planes. All the efforts of all the rest of us are concentrated on putting these people into the air and getting them back again. Most of us are hiding a certain amount of nervousness and anxiety, for many of us are Johnny-come-latelys reserve officers who only recently learned to fly at Corpus Christi in Jacksonville. Others among us are specialists who trained at Quonset Point, Rhode Island. Reserves are called by the regulars, in a friendly way, 90-day wonders. In return, the Annapolis regulars are called the trade school boys. But whether Quonset or Annapolis, all are bound together in the fraternity, the close fellowship of Navy men. Among the ship's non-commissioned personnel, almost 3,000 Blue Jackets and 100 Marines, the hottest shots are the air crewmen, aerial gunners and radio men. These boys and the plane captains are the partners of the Glamour Boys in the air. By non-flying Blue Jackets, they are called Zoom Pigeons or Airedales. And because they receive 50% extra pay for flying, they are sometimes referred to as the Bankroll Boys. Everybody aboard ship backs up the flying group. This requires the efforts of all manner of people. Many of the jobs are far from glamorous. All the little tasks and services you find along Main Street must be performed by some members of our carrier's crew. For though the fighting lady is a powerful ship of war, she is also a sizable American community whose population must be supplied with all the necessities and some of the comforts of home. Sorensen, the pharmacist mate, is just like a village druggist. And next door is our hospital called Sick Bay. It has only a few patients now, but soon it is to be filled with our wounded. Men like these who perform the humble jobs that make life aboard a fighting carrier more bearable, the barbers and the cobblers, are seldom mentioned in communiques. They all have a place in our fighting team. Weeks pass. Now we are far out into the Pacific, which is a very considerable body of water. Monotony shuts down on us between our duties. Guessing where we're bound is still our chief pastime. Will we put into Pearl? Are we going to Iron Bottom Bay? Or maybe even to the Aleutians? All such gossip and rumor are called scuttlebutt or drinking fountain conversation.
Throughout the ship, men get together in little groups to take refuge from the heavy burden of waiting for something to happen. And then one day out of nowhere comes a fast fleet tanker and we're refueled at sea. This tells us something. This tells us that we are not going to Pearl or any other land base for a long, long time. Besides our skipper, we have an admiral aboard, a sea dog who's been a naval flyer for nearly 20 years. Until now, only these officers have known where we are to go. But now Jocko, our captain, confers with the air group commander and reveals the plan. A fighting lady has been ordered to make a strike. She will pass through waters where no carrier task force has ventured since the bloody Battle of Midway. Remember, this is 1943, long before we took the Marshall Islands. Weather studies are made, and though this is a daily routine, somehow the whole ship senses that something is about to happen. Even before the news is broadcast to all of us, there's a new tension and atmosphere of expectancy. And then we are told, we have traveled more than 7,000 miles from Panama so that tomorrow, August 30th, 1943, we can strike the Jap base at Marcus Island, deep within the enemy's ring of defenses. The evening before our first strike, the air group commander briefs all his pilots with maps and a model of our target. We are sticking out our necks to within a thousand miles of Tokyo to divert the Japs' attention from other American activities far south and east of Marcus. Those of us who have never before been in battle, that's most of us, ask a lot of questions of those who have seen action. See gunners, don't break off until you're practically on the same course and right astern of the enemy. Then push over fast. Outwardly, we try to seem composed and cheerful, but a lot's going on inside our minds. We question our most inner selves. What'll it be like? How'll we take it? Will we do all right? This is the night when a lot of boys write one more letter home. Among those playing AC Ducey in the ward room is a chubby 23-year-old from Eureka Springs, Arkansas, Lieutenant E.T. Stover, nicknamed Smokey. That's he sitting on the far right. Having flown 50 missions at Guadalcanal, Smokey has been ordered to take a rest. He'd much rather be flying. Before dark on the eve of battle, our planes are loaded with bombs and gas. So that each plane will be in its precise position for a speedy takeoff, we spot and respot our deck. Now all is perfect. We will strike at dawn. And now GQ, General Quarters. the ship goes to his battle station, his special place on the fighting team. George, the barber, will pass ammunition. Leo, the baker, will be a sky lookout. Frank, the tailor, is assigned to a first aid station. Pilots are in their ready rooms. Each squadron, fighter, bomber, torpedo bomber, assemble separately. Suppliers get into their flight gear and receive last minute data and instructions. On the flight deck, our first battle dawn awaits us. Our whole ship is on hair trigger. The fighting lady is hardly 100 miles from the first target of her career. These last few minutes before the order for our first action are the toughest time of all. A wise man once said, War is mostly waiting. We learn now what that can mean. At last the word comes. Pilots, man your planes. Ready room three, roger. 
pilots, man your planes. take off first to form cover aloft for the other squadrons. Then the bombers, heavy laden with destruction. The sun has risen now and our escorts are alert for enemy submarines. But the fighting lady steams boldly toward our target to lessen the distance for our planes when they return. The radio plotting room is the electric eye and ear by which the fighting lady detects and keeps tab on all planes and ships for miles around us. Smokey, the fighting ace from Arkansas, has been put in charge of this room for our big day. Hunched among his assistants, Smokey is like a super quarterback on a super football team. He is in constant touch with our entire air group. As our first fighters race in toward Marcus Island, they stay low, hoping to escape detection by the enemy's radar. Then they climb suddenly and dive a surprise strafing attack on the enemy's airstrips. These red balls floating up at us so lazily are anti-aircraft fire. There is three times as much of it coming up at us as we can see, because only one shell in three is a tracer. What look like fiery polywogs are tracers from our own wing guns. The ak ak is much heavier than expected, but through it we go to knock out enemy bombers on the ground. All through these battle pictures, realize that we are looking straight down our own gun barrels. These pictures are taken automatically by the same mechanism that operates the guns. Pictures even shake with the gun's recoil. Our eye is now the very eye of our fighting airplane. The enemy's picket boats and supply ships offshore are thoroughly strafed. No longer will these craft bring rice and sake and munitions to Marcus. Our bombers flying higher see the island beginning to burn. A moment ago, it looked like a little jade trinket in a cobalt sea. As the fighters and bombers swing victoriously away from Marcus Island, towering columns of smoke show the thorough job our boys have done. Back aboard ship, Smokey is tracking the flyers with care to be sure that none is missing and that no enemy planes are trying to follow them out to our fighting lady. As our planes come aboard, there begins an operation almost as exciting as the attack itself. A ballet after battle, with the plane directors as dancing masters. The whirling propellers fill this scene with danger, but now our crews are trained and adept. The landing signal officer performs an eloquent adagio on the fighting lady's stern. A warning to the rest of the cast to stay off stage until a limping member can be led out of the way.
pilots go below to report to their combat intelligence officers. They have hot news, good news. They tell what they saw and did, how many rounds of ammunition they fired, how many bombs they dropped, what they hit, what they noticed at the target that was new and different or that may need hitting again. As the reports are added up and our combat photographers develop their pictures, the story becomes better and better. Every single Jap bomber on Marcus has been destroyed. 80% of the shore installations blasted or set afire. Hangars, radio stations, gas dumps, ammunition dumps. Marcus is now a lovely mess. In the radio plot, Smokey is worried. There are planes still up there and he's wondering about them. They are ours, though, delayed by battle damage. Landing a shot-up plane on the carrier is a crucial test of how well-trained, how alert and steady a naval flyer is. The fighting lady now has met her enemy. And in the wardroom, the pilots who this morning felt new and nervous now talk like veterans. We have been baptized by fire and have survived nicely. We of the fighting lady are growing up. The admiral of our task force knows the overall strategy of the whole Pacific campaign. To smash straight through Japan's outer network of islands, to recapture the Philippines and land on the mainland of Asia. Thus we will deny Japan supplies from Malaya and the Dutch East Indies and leave her far-flung island garrisons marooned. Then we will reach out and really help our ally China. Months after Marcus, this campaign is well started. Our carrier task forces have been in many battles. And now, early in 1944, the fighting lady's target is Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands. These are Jap Zeros, fighter screen being pierced by our planes and planes from eight other carriers, preparatory to strafing Kwajalein and bombing it apart. Our fighter pilots have improved with practice, with the confidence that comes from experience. They estimate their range by watching their tracers. They hold their fire until their wing gun bullets converge at 300 yards. shoot in bursts instead of in steady streams, which heat up the guns and spend ammunition. Kwajalein burning, very satisfactory. After our bombing attacks and heavy shelling by our surface ships, assault craft filled with Marines and Army hit the beaches. And very soon after that, Kwajalein is ours. After Kwajalein, word comes to our admiral that a truck, Japan's huge and secret naval fortress 1,400 miles to the west, there apparently are some heavy units of the Japanese battle fleet. Perhaps we can surprise them. Again, the fighting ladies' squadron and squadrons from other carriers take off for combat. A lot of mouths are dry at the thought that our target is mighty truck. The rear seat gunners look back at the fighting lady, wondering when and if they will ever return to her. All 
that we know about truck, we know from a few photographs taken by some nervy Marines on reconnaissance just 18 days ago. We hear that it is a complex of heavily fortified islands surrounded by airstrips, with naval anchorages at certain spots among the islands. For the next two days, more than 1,000 of our carrier-based planes are going to sweep in on truck in relays. The planes appear to float gently off our bow. Actually, their airspeed is a good 70 knots. Diving in on truck, we again turn on our guns and their synchronized cameras. Truck's defenders are aloft and we smack them hard. that were in men's mouths before this strike began now settle back into place and are singing once more. There's something really grand, something historic about diving in here on this place which Japan has been building and guarding jealously from all the Japanese eyes for 20 years. We dive right in low and take a good look at fighter strips, bomber bases, and seaplane ramps. In an almost vertical dive, the pilot may black out or go blind for a moment when he pulls up and out at the bottom. But the camera won't black out. It cannot see the landing of our own bomb, for we'll be up and away before that reaches the target. But it records the hits of other planes ahead of us. the Jap fleet here, but most of it's gone. Some lingering ships, including some of their fast fleet tankers, we find hiding in sheltered coves. The vessels which we are now strafing are other fleet auxiliaries, rice boats, transports, and ammunition ships. With bursts of 50 caliber incendiaries and armor-piercing slugs, we set them on fire, rip them open often wide enough to sink. Ships filled with TNT is not very healthy for pilots who dive too low. But it's hard to tell who's carrying what until the Big Bang comes. Returning to the deck at 130 miles an hour with a flap shot away, all a pilot can hope to save is his own skin. Here comes our new air group commander. He's had a bit of trouble. His windshield is blotted with blood and he has to feel his way aboard. Strafing at low altitude, he took a 40 millimeter anti-aircraft burst right in the face. More than 200 wounds and his plane a sieve. But he'll live to fly again. Some planes will not return, but Others come back and land somehow, anyhow. 
Considering the toughness of truck, our losses are astonishingly light. No time is lost getting casualties below. It's a long way from truck to our secret rendezvous in the Marshall Islands. Someday it can be told just where this is. Actually, it is a magnificent new fleet anchorage, an advanced naval base, which we have taken from the Japs and made secure. Now, for the first time, we, who have been operating as separate, relatively small task forces, see assemble the enormous mass of naval power. Over one million tons of American fighting steel. New carriers, new battleships, new cruisers and fleet auxiliaries in an amount which Japan could never conceive let alone produce. That we are able to maintain supply lines over the vast distances of the Pacific is one of the miracles of this war. In the comforting presence of so much power, we relax and refresh our battle-strained nerves. Push my head under. Our ship's post office now does really big business. Letters for us at last from home. Letters from us to friends and families. Our sensors know our collective mood, our central hopes and thoughts. The stuff is really getting out here now. I can't tell you much about it, but oh boy. And the more we get, well, the sooner I'll be seeing you. All hands are called together. Our old skipper, Jocko, has been promoted admiral. Our new one's name is Dixie. Men, as soon as I finish talking, we are getting underway. Our fighting lady is now part of what is designated Task Force 58. As you know, our final destination is a place called Tokyo. We'll have to fight hard to get there. But when we drop our hook at Yokohama, I'm going to throw a party. All hands are cordially invited. Task forces are built compactly now around carriers like ourselves with speedy new battle wagons at our side. A carrier skipper never leaves the bridge at sea because carriers and their planes are the first to strike the enemy or to be struck by him. Our aircraft pilots are constantly on call for despite the mass of power spread out around us, these are still dangerous waters. Our pilots know this all too well, but it doesn't worry them now, for they're seasoned. They know how. There are a lot of new faces among us, but most of these men, too, have been in action. At places like Hollandia, Mili, Joluit, Palau, Rabaul, Wake, Meloilap. Our rear seat gunners and radio men are old hands now. Some of their faces are different, too, because there have been replacements. A lot of them have been made commissioned officers. There's a saying in the Navy that you never learn to love a carrier until she gets hurt. Well, perhaps we don't really love our fighting lady, but we've become mighty fond of her and almost comfortable, almost at home. Occasionally, our shipboard movies bring us that one thing we crave the most, one touch of something utterly American, one deep breath of home. Like Jocko, our new skipper, Dixie, is an old hell-diving Navy pilot. In their battle caps, he and Admiral Mitcher look like big league baseball managers. 
Northwest we steam, and never before in history has an ocean borne such a weight of naval power. Not a Jutland, not a Japan's proud boast, Tsushima, was there anywhere near the force with which we now assert that this is our ocean. This is our air. And we're seeking the Japanese battle fleet to prove it. With our cruisers and our biggest new battle wagons present, we are strong enough to hope, really to hope, that we may provoke the Japanese fleet into accepting a fight. We're joined by plotting Coast Guard and Navy transports. The Marines again. So, another amphibious assault is cooking. Patrols have spotted an enemy search plane and are after her. He's a big bird. A 20 ton, four motored Kawanishi seaplane, the kind we call Emily's. Miss Emily's a tough old girl. Right now, she's screaming for help and telling Tokyo by radio where we are. Hellcats are closing in on it. So long, Emily. Now that the enemy knows where we are, and we know he knows, our brass hats get together on final arrangements for what may turn into another midway. Our objective, the first of many in our drive through to the Philippines and China, will be the Marianas. In battles just ahead of us, we are to make good use of a multitude of weapons, special devices, and techniques which have been evolved through the 30 years since the U.S. Navy first took to the air. Not only did our naval flyers create the aircraft carrier itself, but it was they who devised the torpedo plane and invented and perfected dive bombing. Disposed about our flight deck so that planes can be quickly armed are all manner of death-dealing objects. 500, 1,000, and 2,000 pound bombs. We have torpedoes and incendiaries, and the kind of anti-personnel bombs we call daisy cutters. Some of our bombs are armor-piercing, some for fragmentation. Others have delayed action fuses to prolong the effect of our bombardment for hours after we have delivered it. Here are the new rockets, which pack the same wallop as a three-inch shell. They weigh little, and because there isn't much recoil, they can be fired from planes. On the eve of battle, we are told to scrub up to lessen the danger of infection in case we're wounded. As well as our bodies, most of us prepare our souls. Always on the eve of battle, divine services are held in relays so that every one of our fighting ladies' 3,000 sons has a chance to attend. As the eve before battle lengthens, there is the usual waiting. Again, we're reminded that war is mostly waiting.
Because all cooks and bakers must soon be at their battle stations, they work all night long preparing a hearty meal of steak and eggs for our 3 a.m. battle breakfast. We're being attacked. We're being attacked by Japanese torpedo planes skimming in after us wing to water. All they want is one hit on our flight deck. We have nearly 90 planes fueled and loaded with bombs ready for the takeoff. Patch of flame is a burning jack. In this surprise attack, 19 Japs are polished off by our ship's batteries. Not a single carrier is hit. We have been fortunate. So now commences another major moment in the fighting lady's career. Flight quarters sounds. In this modern warfare, the young plane captains are to their pilots what squires were to armored knights of old. In this operation, typical of many more to come, a lot of other fighting ladies will be involved. And nearly 2,000 carrier-based planes, all of them attacking in air groups like our own. tighten our belts and steady our hands as our Navy makes progressively bigger attacks nearer and nearer the heart of Japan. At his post and radio plot, tracking down enemy planes and cursing the luck that keeps him out of the air, Smokey chafes at being grounded on a day like this, especially when targets are juicy ones. All the Jap air bases and military installations in the Marianas, and a special prize package, Guam. The island which we did not fortify, but the Japs did. Now comes word that the Japs have sent strong air reinforcements to Tinian, which flanks Guam. Again, our synchronized cameras record, as no human eye and memory could record, just what our guns and bombs do to the enemy. These pictures enable our air combat intelligence officers to assess the damage as we swoop down upon Tinian. return for more fuel and ammunition, the surface vessels take over. 
prodigious naval barrage to prepare the beaches our assault forces are going to hit. Not only our newest, but some of our oldest and proudest battleships are here. The Colorado, the Tennessee, and the USS Pennsylvania, flagship of World War I. Winging home to the fighting lady, several of our planes, crippled, make a game attempt to land. Now is when the landing signal officer must judge not only the speed, but estimate the battle damage of planes like these. And flight deck emergency crews, firefighters, rescue details, and medical corpsmen exhibit almost incredible courage. of a torpedo plane has been unable to release his load of incendiaries. Burning thermite is spilling out at incandescent heat. In the plane's tanks remain about 75 gallons of high octane gas. The men who brave this danger to save pilot and crew deserve every citation they get. ready rooms, intelligence officers question battle-weary pilots. What did you see? Any Jap carriers in sight? Are you sure they were carrier-based planes? Then from radio plot comes uncomfortable news. Torpedo planes and dive bombers from enemy aircraft carriers are approaching. All hands, man your battle stations. To our engine room go orders for flank speed which is a few knots faster than full speed, in case we need to take evasive action. All boilers are lighted to let the fighting lady outdo herself if necessary. The engine room people turn on the heat, and the propeller shafts churn like fate in their alleys. The fighting lady leaps through the sea on her guard. Skipper Dixie gears himself for action, and so does wise old Scrappy. And now, here they come. keeps coming through our wall of black. He's approaching us fast with a life that must be charmed. Our gunners throw everything they've got, but still she comes. If he ever releases that torpedo, she missed us. Either the pilot was already dead or his release gear jammed. Smokey, the pride of Arkansas, hears about that one. He almost takes off. Now our reconnaissance has spotted the Japanese task forces. This is the moment we've been fighting and praying for. Every plane that can fly and every qualified pilot is ordered into the air. At last, Smokey gets his chance to fly again. 
Pilots, man your planes. Pilots, man your planes. trade wind is tearing down our flight deck. Our planes strain forward to rise into it. Our entire air group thunders out behind the group commander. Now our fighters run into a swarm of Jap fighters, mostly Zeros, sent up to intercept our attack on the Japanese fleet. A mad aerial scramble begins which the boys to this day still call the Mariana's turkey shoot. 369 Jap planes are shot down in this single day to our loss of 22. Japanese plane makers have sacrificed strength and firepower for agility. Their planes disintegrate quickly when you hit them. They have no armor plate as ours have, nor are their gas tanks self-sealing. These are fancy flyers. They think aerobatics can win dog fights, whereas we believe in smooth flying and careful shooting. afternoon haze from high altitude, our air combat group sights the Imperial Japanese battle fleet. These are the first pictures ever taken of a great enemy naval formation like this. There it is, that Imperial fleet, crawling around below us in violent evasive action. Us looking down on them the seas they think they own. Some of these Japanese ships are scampering away at better than 40 knots. When you bore straight down on them, they twist, squirm. shoot out his bridge, and he shoots back, plenty. Let's go down after that cruiser. He answers us emphatically from the forward turret. thousand ton Jap carrier of the Hayataka class is going to get it. Watch five o'clock in the camera, the lower right hand corner of the screen. This big flat top gets it where the turkey got the axe.
touch off some of these babies. Just watch this one. And now we come home from the Battle of the Philippine Sea. 17 Jap warships have been sunk or severely damaged. Several of our returning planes have been badly shot up. A dive bomber comes in out of gas. He pulls off to starboard, but nose is over because his wheels are down. This pilot has 73 holes in his plane, and his leg almost shot away. To clear the deck for other planes, number 30, badly damaged, is jettisoned, given the deep six. Watch carefully. This man's controls are all but shot away. Steps out of it, smart. And now it is time to paint up the scores. On this fine morning, just a year after being commissioned, the fighting lady is beginning to look like a stamp album. She has done her share, amassing Task Force 58's grand total of 757 Jap aircraft destroyed in a two-week turkey shoot. There's another score to add up, our own casualties. Quite a few faces are no longer with us on the fighting lady. Among them, Lieutenant Commander Upson, skipper of our torpedo squadron. Lieutenant Pappy Condit. Lieutenant John Meehan. And that fighting is gentleman, Lieutenant Smokey Stover. Yes, Smokey's missing, too. Salute them under their country's flag. For they were brave. They were gallant. Others will come forward to take their places. For the battles we have fought on the seas and in the sky are only the beginning. Still hungry for battle will steam our carrier. Serene, powerful, unafraid. She and her planes will come home again someday, God grant, but not until the bitter, glorious end. For she is, and we salute her, the fighting lady. Welcome to the USS Yorktown CV-10 at Patriots Point Naval and Maritime Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. Here since January 1976, the Yorktown has been open to the public and annually visited by over a quarter of a million Americans. My name is Dwight Long. As a lieutenant in the Navy Reserve, I was assigned by the Assistant Secretary of the Navy to board the USS Yorktown and photographed carrier warfare in the Pacific. The result was the motion picture you have just seen, The Fighting Lady, which won the Academy Award. In 1944, when The Fighting Lady was premiered and shown in movie theaters across the country, the war with Japan was at its height. The identity of the ship and her officers were all top secret. Now, 40 years later, in the following pictures and narrative, 
We will tell you who these men were and what they did during World War II and how they are memorialized or, if living, their involvement with the Fighting Lady today. The Fighting Man from Arkansas, Lieutenant Smokey Stover, was never heard from again after his wingman saw him in his life raft off the entrance to Truck Harbor. He was probably executed that night, along with 10 pilots from other carriers who were shot down during the first strike on Japan's Pearl Harbor. Smokey has not been forgotten, as you are now sitting in the Smokey Stover Yorktown Memorial Theater. As you leave, you will see at the front of the theater, Smokey's plaque, along with over 200 plaques memorializing and honoring his Yorktown shipmates. Captain J.J. Jocko Clark, skipper of the USS Yorktown, was part Cherokee Indian, which sparked his fighting spirit. We'll never be ready for combat unless you flight deck crews learn right now to work as a team. Don't you men realize that before long we'll be in dangerous waters? That's too slow, bear a hand! He was a hard-hitting taskmaster, while always aggressive and respected. Watch out, keep that wing clear! Jocko was promoted to Rear Admiral and assigned by Admiral Nimitz to get command to a fast starboard. carrier task Way group. Come on, get the lead out of your pants! In the Yorktown Association Wardroom Museum and Lounge, one deck below the Stover Theater, he is pictured as a four-star admiral, having been commander of the 7th Fleet during the Korean War. His painting is surrounded by pictures of the 24 captains who succeeded him in command of the Fighting Lady, from February 1944 to her decommissioning in 1970. Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher, who as commander of the famous Task Force 58, January 1944 through August 1945, led our fast carriers to victory over Japan. Admiral Mitcher's memorial is mounted on the island structure of the flight deck in the Carrier Aviation Hall of Fame. Admiral Mitcher was captain of the USS Hornet in 1942 for the Doolittle Tokyo Raid and the Battle of Midway. Commander James H. Jimmy Flatley was universally regarded as one of the Navy's two top carrier fighter pilots between 1931 and the end of World War II. Jimmy Flatley was the first air group commander of the USS Yorktown, flying the first F-6F Hellcat to see combat during the strike on Marcus Island August 1943. After World War II, Commander Flatley was eventually promoted to Vice Admiral and was in command of all naval aviation when he tragically died prematurely in 1958. He too is now memorialized on the Yorktown in the Carrier Aviation Hall of Fame. Jim Flatley's number 00 Hellcat is now proudly displayed on the hangar deck. In addition to his many contributions to carrier aviation during his lifetime, Vice Admiral Jimmy Flatley left a heritage that is very likely to be his greatest legacy, second and third generation fighter pilots and leaders. His son, Rear Admiral James H. Jim Flatley, is the present Navy's most experienced fighter pilot. He holds the record for making 1,600 carrier landings, the most in the 60-year history of U.S. carrier aviation, and made 350 combat missions during three separate deployments in the Vietnam War. He is currently serving as director of the Navy's strike and amphibious forces at the Pentagon. His son, Lieutenant J.G. James H. Seamus Flatley, was president of his senior class at the Naval Academy. He has successfully completed jet carrier qualification aboard the Enterprise. This will give the Jimmy Flatley family an unprecedented three generations of carrier fighter pilots. This amazing heritage can be very conceivably extended to a fourth generation as the result of the birth of James H. Jimmy Flatley IV, 
This royal family of naval aviation is planning on his going to Pensacola for fighter pilot training in the year 2007. The Yorktown's landing signal officer, Lieutenant Dick Tripp, hard at work in 1944. Today at the Yorktown's 40th anniversary ceremonies, he signals the TBM plane that flies by, honoring the 184 brave men of the Yorktown who gave their lives. He is currently president of the Yorktown CV-10 Association. Just as he conducted the burial at sea ceremonies on the deck of the Fighting Lady, our chaplain, Reverend Bob Alexander, presides over the 40th anniversary commemorating those brave men who gave their lives for American freedom. Reverend Alexander was the Yorktown's first Protestant chaplain. He has conducted the annual memorial services on the Fighting Lady since 1975. Of the three other lost pilots named and pictured at the end of the film, one, Lieutenant Pop Condit, was unexpectedly found very much alive at the end of the war in a POW camp in a railroad yard in downtown Tokyo. Pop and his two air crewmen were shot down during the Yorktown's very first engagement, the strike against Marcus Island in 1943. After having to ditch their crippled Avenger torpedo bomber approximately 50 miles off the coast of Marcus and floating around in their life raft for several days, they were lucky to be spotted and picked up by a Japanese fishing boat. Pop Condit was selected because of his outstanding leadership and example in several prison camps to represent naval aviation's POWs at the signing of the Japanese surrender aboard the USS Missouri in 1945. Subsequently, he made the Navy a career and retired as a rear admiral. Currently, he is chairman of the board of the Yorktown CV-10 Association and is standing in front of a TBM Avenger. This plane was purchased and restored by Rear Admiral Condit and the other surviving pilots and air crewmen of Torpedo Bomber Squadrons 5 and 1 in memory of their squadron mates who did not come back. The aviation ordnance officer was Lieutenant James T. Bryan, Jr., who was ordered to the Yorktown in February 1943, two months before her commissioning, and served aboard until October 1944. His 160-man division was responsible for the storage and loading of all machine gun ammunition, bombs, torpedoes, rockets, and incendiaries for the Air Group's 90 planes. In addition, they maintained the gun cameras on the Hellcat fighter planes that took the air-to-air -air and air-to-surface pictures you have just seen. Jim Bryan has dedicated a large portion of his life to preserving and enhancing the spirit of the fighting lady. His multitude of contributions include founding the USS Yorktown Association in 1948, serving as its executive director for the past 36 years, which is a record far surpassing any other veterans organization. He negotiated with the Navy Department, which eventually resulted in the Yorktown being acquired by South Carolina and towed to Patriots Point. He raised the funds to build the Smoky Stover Memorial Theater and purchased the TBM dive bomber, F6F00, and the Corsair displayed in the Memorial Hangar Bay just aft of the Smoky Stover Theater. He acquired the names, dates, and text for the 200 bronze plaques mounted on the hangar deck and in other areas of the ship, conceiving and developing the Arlington of Carrier Aviation. Presently, we have 44 plaques memorializing the 3,650 brave men who made the supreme sacrifice while serving on 44 of the Fighting Lady's sister carriers during World War II, Korea, and the Vietnam Wars. <laughs>